Now stand aside, worthy adversary. Tis but a scratch. A scratch? Your arm's off. No, it isn't. Well, what's that, then? I've heard worse. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. I am the Brewmaster coming to you all the way from a uh, drippy and dreary San Francisco this morning. But that's okay. That just sets the tone for what we're going to be talking about today, for the tears that your players are going to be crying when you hit them with these combat rules that I'm going to give you today. But let me just set the record straight before we get into it. I'm not giving you ways to kill your players, although... Some of you may die, but it's a sacrifice I am willing to make. I'm giving you tools to make the combat feel way more lethal, much more brutal and deadly. So that's the feeling that we're going to go for. But then it'll also be way more dynamic and engaging for you and your players too. And we're going to be taking notes from one of my favorite movies of all time, The Raid Redemption. If you haven't seen this movie, watch it, study it, and then apply it to whatever RPG that you're playing. Because if you're playing any game that has combat, where you're rolling dice against each other. If you're playing Call of Cthulhu, don't fight, just run. Run! 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 But if you're playing any other kind of <laughs> if you're playing any other kind of role play game, then the rules or the methods that I give you here today could be pretty pretty loosely applied to those games as well. Though I will be specifically referring to the fifth edition of Dungeons and Dragons in this video. So why is it in your games does it feel like when you're rolling dice against the characters that the combat's feeling like this? This is the finals. These boys are going at it toe to toe. Instead of this. Well, let's talk about how we start achieving this level of intensity right now. So the first and primary method, and probably the simplest and most common sense solution is to just up the damage. And I think that DMs or GMs would usually do this by increasing the amount of dice that they roll. But I feel like that's almost a roundabout method because if you really want a monster to feel deadly, how many DMs or GMs have actually considered running your monsters with a minimum damage? If I know that these PCs are fighting a lycanthrope, and I'm, and I'm just throwing numbers out here, but let's say the party is num uh, level 10 and the lycanthrope is a CR6 creature. And so numbers wise, they should really not have a difficult time killing it if they can hit it. But when you look at the amount of damage that it rolls, you look at it as like it can't even really hurt the party. But you've rolled this random encounter and you think it's kind of cool and you want to use it, but you toss it because it's so weak, right? There's no reason to do that. If you run your monster with a minimum damage in mind and you say, well, these people are going to be fighting a lycanthrope and because it's a supernatural werewolf beast creature, if it runs up on my human fighter, even if they are level 10 and it grabs them and begins to sunder them apart, it's going to do a minimum of 50 points of damage. And then I'll roll damage dice on top of that. And that's a really quick and effective way of making each combat feel pretty lethal because you don't want it to feel like necessarily the difficulty of the game is scaling with the characters you want them to feel like they're meeting challenges that meet their character where they're at and if you want a more realistic feel having monsters especially big monsters do immense amounts of damage or even dealing a minimal amount on every single hit is something that i find is especially useful for monster creatures like vampires werewolves things that are supposed to have immense strength but that isn't really reflected on the stat block that 5e gives you. And what the hell is up with unarmed combat in fifth edition? It's almost useless unless you're a monk. And even then, so in my games, I rule that all weapon attacks, unarmed, armed, if it's improvised, whatever, if you're using something to strike another human being, you're gonna be at least doing 1d4 damage. That's going to automatically make everything in combat feel way more deadly because that means you can pick up a wine bottle off of the table smash it over somebody's head and know it's going to do at least 1d4 and when that breaks then you have an improvised dagger in your hand that's going to be the bottle shiv that will do 1d4 damage and if you have proficiency with improvised weapons you may be the best barroom brawler that there ever was using my combat system and you would be very very effective in spaces like that which gets me to my next point 
which is the most interesting and best thing about the raid redemption and that is the constant use of the environment and fighting with objects in the environment If you are not using the environment to the extent that they are moving using the environment in this movie, then you are really robbing your players of a truly rich experience when it comes to the combat. You want to consider logically what lies outside of the four walls that is contained within this combat encounter. And I'm not talking about just the four walls. I'm talking about the floor and the ceiling too. What is above us? If a fireball goes off and ricochets against the ceiling, what is gonna come pouring down into the room? If my players want to blow a hole in the floor, what is underneath this? If they wanna blow a hole in any of these walls, what's on the other side of these walls? Those are the kinds of things that are gonna add a dynamic feel because even if your players don't think about it, you as the DM have, which means that when you interact with the environment, those things will naturally come into play. You'll know what's above, what's below, what's outside of the more or less. You don't have to fully design these things. You want to have a general idea, and that's all you really need, unless you have some sort of centerpiece or set piece plan. But if not, just have a general idea. Say that I know that they're in an underground cave, so over the top of them, let's say, there's some sort of underground water reserve, and if they explode the roof, this cavern is gonna start filling up with water. I just came up with that off the top of my head and it didn't take me any time. And it's that easy to think of something. And when you give them those clues, when that first shatter goes off and they hear the rock crack and water starts to drip down into the cavern, that automatically adds some tension to the combat where there wasn't any before. Even if they're fighting level one goblins, all of a sudden, holy shit, we got to be careful with the magic that we're casting. And that automatically adds some tension because as soon as my players figure that out, even without having to think, I'm, not, I'm coming up with this on the spot, I'm going to automatically have my goblins start throwing something that is loud. They're gonna have some sort of, you know, flashbang or something that they throw, some sort of noise maker, and it's gonna continue shaking the walls. So now my super low level goblins are posing a much, much more dangerous threat to my level five, level six characters who would normally just kill them in one hit. Now they're not just fighting goblins. They're trying to stop the goblins, they're trying to kill them before the goblins collapse the tunnel on top of everybody unknowingly because they're stupid goblins if you want to run them that way and so then that is the outside of the walls but then what is actually within the room you want to think about that too you want to think about that the most and this you do need to plan out what is in the room what are on the tables what are in the cabinets if you're fighting in a, in a cabin what do the peasants have around they have pots they have pans do they have gardening tools that could be used as makeshift weapons. Do they have pitchforks laying around or axes or hoes? Do they have these types of tools that the players can pick up if they get disarmed? Are they cooking soup on the stove that can be tipped over and cause some sort of spill that burns people who walk through it or you, they have to make some sort of deck save? Are there dynamic and natural elements that you can find that are already gonna be in the environment that the combat is happening in? If you know that the combat is going to be happening on top of a roof, like on a rooftop, what are some natural things that can be on a rooftop? Maybe slippery tiles. They can try to you know, kick the tiles out from underneath their opponent and have them slip off the roof. These are the types of things that you always need to be thinking about if you want your combat to feel deadly. You want it to feel truly dangerous, but the danger comes from the thrill of the chase, You know, the thrill of the uncertainty feeling like you might slip off the roof, feeling like the cavern might collapse. And even if you're fighting a weak enemy, these extra hazards that you're throwing into the player's path are going to elevate your combat. By the same token, putting things in the environment for the player to interact with to spark their creativity is gonna make every single combat feel incredibly unique and different. Like this scene.
I know that a lot of DMs would have a huge problem with players trying to take a tandem turn, using their turn together to move a refrigerator to the door, using it as full cover to protect themselves from fire, and putting a grenade in it, and turning it toward the door, and blowing it up. Like, so many DMs would have a problem with that because, well, frankly, if, if you're running a lot of tabletop games, they're just not going to give you the rules that allow you to adjudicate that smartly and on the fly. But that leads me to my very next point, and that is allow your players to be creative. And by that, I mean allow them, within reason, to do whatever they want. And when I say this, I'm only talking about in regards to the character's skills. So in my game, I allow one free skill check per turn. Regardless of what the character does, they get to pick a skill, and if they can explain to me intelligently how they're going to use it, they can go ahead and use that skill. I have no problem with it. Also, my combat rounds are extended to 10 seconds, so there's a little bit more time for them to act and do things like that. And I allow that certain amount of role play for them to try to do anything that makes sense for the character to try to do in that round. If that's harassing somebody, I allow it. If that's poking somebody in the eye, slide a hand check. If that's stepping on somebody's toe to try to trip them, I allow that. Because that's gonna, one, be fun, but my players also understand that the enemies get a chance to do that too. And I use this power as the dungeon master responsibly. And I role play monsters at their level of competency. So goblins are not gonna be making a whole lot of skill checks. Maybe a hobgoblin will if they come across a smart one who's running a bunch of little goblins around. Maybe they get into combat with him and he's very skilled and he starts making a lot of checks against them and start trying to trip them and faint them out and all sorts of things and that will make the combat feel deadlier and much more dynamic as well. These are all just options too, by the way. Nothing that I say here in this video is gospel or law. These are options and, and tweaks that I wanna give to you so that you can use them. And I have like a whole document of different homebrew rules that I can use. And I don't use all of these, and sometimes I may use one or two of these. Sometimes I may use all of these if my players really like it and they want brutal combat, then I'll use all of these. but. These are just some options for you. And so then when you combine all of these things, what you really do have is a much more dynamic and lethal situation. You have minimum damage that's being thrown around. Like if you get hit, you're gonna take at least this much. You have even unarmed strikes, you know, and with uh, unarmed strikes in my system, I allow even pushing, shoving, bashing, you know, somebody's head into the wall, shoving somebody into the ground, stomping on somebody. All of this is gonna be doing 1d4 damage, 1d6 damage plus your strength or your dex and so you will be not only getting fucked up but you will be fucking people up and it is going to feel brutal and crunchy but not in a slow math kind of way but in a mosh pit kind of way you know what i mean and when you plant those usable props all around the environment you want to put furniture everywhere tables should be moving chairs should be flipped over couches should be destroyed like when your pcs get done fighting in that room some shit should have moved around and have your npcs interact with the environment if your player characters are just camping on top of a carpet have an npc run up and snatch that bitch out from under them and have them fall prone have your npcs cut the chandelier off the wall and fall on top of your pcs have your npcs flipping tables over and chairs over for cover have your npcs throwing bombs have them throwing pots of oil over at the npcs and trying to light them on fire have them fully interact with the environment because you as the DM, well, you're the, the coach, you're the referee. You must lead by example. And if you want your players to do this, then you have to first show them by example that these sorts of things are even possible, that your world is interactable in that way. Because unfortunately, a lot of DMs don't have interactable worlds like that. And that's a shame, truly, because it's just a missed opportunity. It doesn't mean that your game is bad or horrible or that you're a terrible DM or anything like that. It just means that the game is not gonna be as dynamic as it could be. And that gets me into the very next thing, which are critical hits. Critical hits in <laughs> fifth edition, when you roll a 20 and then you roll snake eyes on crits, so you roll like a one and a two, it's ridiculous. I would consider if you want a really lethal combat or something that feels dangerous and also rewards the player while making the combat feel super dangerous is to always have crits deal max damage. So if you do 1d6 and you deal a crit, then it should do a, at least a full six damage that the weapon does. And then roll another 1d6 on top of that, which is the rest of the damage that the weapon does in the follow through. By allowing a crit to do maximum damage, what you start to see is players fear combat. Even if they're at a high level and they're fighting 
any sort of low level enemy that has pack tactics and they know that those people are going to be rolling with advantage when they when they surround them even a level 10 party will avoid a pack of goblins at my table and that is how you know that you have lethal combat because they know no they're not gonna probably lose that combat but they're gonna all be rolling with advantage and if they get crit four or five times they're gonna be in bad shape and that's also partially due to the next system that i'm going to talk about right now have a system for injuries injuries are something that's going to make the combat feel consequential and that's important to making the combat feel lethal and deadly because if there are no consequences then it's not going to feel lethal or deadly at all and so what are the consequences well you may consider having your players get injured on a crit you may also consider them being injured if they go down in combat and then come back up now in terms of applying an injury on a critical hit, like if they get, you know, stabbed through and they take the max, because in my system they take the max damage, so they take the max damage and then they take, and then some, I may apply a bleeding effect, which is a status that I have, based on how much damage they took or what, or the type of damage that they took or the type of attack that they took. And I've run this a couple different ways and you as the DM may try a couple different options. A couple different ways that I've tried running this is rolling with percentile dice behind the screen so if they get crit, then there's a certain percentage based on the monster type. So I'll say that if you're fighting a cobalt and they crit, they're probably going to have a 5% chance of actually injuring the character or like a 20% chance of actually injuring them and then I'll roll the percentile dice. Another way that I've done this is having the character roll a constitution saving throw after they get hit. If they roll really poorly, like below a 10 or below a 15, depending on the enemy, then they accrue an injury and these injuries stack and they are minor penalties like they're supposed to be that reflect the wear and tear that naturally occurs while the combat happens because there's no way that you're fighting like this without looking like this after the fight and that is what's going to make it feel so crunchy and good when they look around and their character is fucked They've been crit two or three times. So they're bleeding, they're hamstrung, so their speed is reduced. They have a slight concussion because they've been punched in the head and so their total HP may be reduced a little bit. So they're bleeding, you know, and if they move too much, it's gonna tear. They can't walk real good. Their head is fucking hurting, but they look around and they see that they've dropped 15 NPCs in unarmed combat maybe. Or they were in armed combat, but it was all just broken bottles. And I've had some amazing and epic fights at my table using these rules. And that is exactly the feeling that you can invoke with just using even one or two of these rules, let alone all of them. Though I would just really check with your players before you start homebrewing things on the fly. If you haven't started the campaign yet, bring these up at the session zero. If you have started the campaign, just talk to everybody make sure they're okay with you changing everything because take it from me players hate it when you start <laughs> they don't appreciate it when you start homebrewing things on the fly and just changing things it makes everybody upset so use everything <laughs> that i give you here responsibly and don't just go out there you know ruining people's days because ultimately this is about making the combat more deadly but it's not really about killing the character you know it's about making it feel like the character had a really tough ordeal because that's what combat should be and so getting back to the injury system, it's important to remember that these injuries should linger then too. After the fight is over and they're feeling the injuries, oh man, we won, and they're looking at the bodies and they're picking over the loot, those injuries should linger until they take another long rest. Or if you're if you're running 5e, then that's a long rest. If you're in one of my games, then it would be until they take a full rest, which is basically a 24-hour long rest at a safe location, an inn, you know, a house, a safe house that they own, a property that they own, a residence or whatever. And it's at that time that they can recover fully. I have known some DMs to run it where injuries recover over time. And not so much more simulationist style, but then that gets more into, you know, the more open world aspects. And we're not going to be covering that today. But one thing that you might do to make combat seem even more deadly is to make health potions rare. Now, I know in the DMG it says they're a common item. But if you make health potions rare, and then with the lingering injury system that I just mentioned, you make it so that health potions are one of the only magical ways outside of casting a spell that allows you to remove an injury while you're in the field. And then you cut the amount of health potions that you introduce into your game by like a half or a fourth. Well, you make them really potent and that'll make the combat seem way more risky because the players will say, 
man, dude, we, we haven't found any potions in a while. And we only got one or two. And if we go into this fight, even against these kobolds, and they start critting us, we might have to use these before we get to the dungeon that we're trying to go to. And they'll just, they'll just try not to get into that fight because they know that it's going to hurt. <laughs> and there's no way around the fact that fighting against a contingency of anybody, even if you win, it's going to hurt. But that about wraps up the video today. I hope you enjoyed it and that anything that I said here got some ideas rattling around in your noggin and that you can get around to rattling around your PC's noggins with some heavy haymakers, some minimum damage that knocks them back, destroy the environment, pick up chairs and hit them with them, punch them through walls, through the floors, through the ceiling, throw bottles at them, break everything, smash everything, punch everybody, crit everything, and raise all sorts of hell. <laughs> But everybody, thanks for watching. You know, we already have like 30 subscribers and I'm super surprised by that. Um, and so thank you everybody who's already been watching and subscribing, it means a lot. And we are gonna continue to come out with more videos. We're starting up an art channel where I'll be live streaming myself uh, doing D&D artwork. You know, I'm a, my full-time job is I'm an illustrator, mostly comics. So I'll be doing some drawing on that channel, doing some black and white um, inks, illustrations of comic style. So. Look out for some updates on that. We were hoping to do some sort of like 50 subscriber giveaway, but we didn't think we were gonna have to do that for some time, but we're more than halfway there already. So, wow. Thanks everybody for watching, we appreciate it. All right, bye. <laughs> if you made it all the way to the end of the video, thank you so much for watching. Gracias por mirar. I have nothing but gratitude for you because when you give our channel a chance, it builds our community and gives us an opportunity to learn together to be better tabletop RPG players, which is, por supuesto, what this channel is all about. Como agradecimiento, vengo con regalos. Your support is much more meaningful than you could ever know, and so these gifts are for you. At the end of every single video, I will give away free content for those who've watched all the way through. The content will often be themed after the video and can include anything from stat blocks for NPCs, monsters and villains, lore, magic items, random charts and roll tables, feats, items, Items, spells, class features, abilities, and God knows what other homebrew. So make sure you check back every single episode to see what's new. If you want to support our show and help us increase our production value as well as the rate that we produce content, then please consider joining our Patreon. The link is in the description below, beneath the like button, but above the subscribe button. And again, thank you so much for watching. Gracias por escuchar, and I'll see you in the next one.